station. One reason was that the Mafia was busy buying protection for itself. Bill Bonanno says he would meet corrupt police officers in a restaurant to give them their bribes. I had dinner at a little restaurant. I was there with two other friends. And we were sitting around, and they said, you have a look of nostalgia on your face. What, what's your, what, what's up? I said, you know, I, I used to come here in the late 40s and the early 50s, and I turned around, and I said, I used to sit in that corner back there. And I used to meet with a captain and two lieutenants from law enforcement. And one of them said, well, what were you doing here? I said, we were giving them their envelopes. <laughs> envelopes for what? To look the other way while we had the gambling, we had the, the horse racing, the bookmaking, and the numbers. The commission was presiding over a boom time. As he rose through the ranks of the mob, Bill Bonanno attended several meetings of the commission with his father, Mafia boss Joe Bonanno. The commission boasted it was so powerful that it could even influence government. I can remember a time, and, a, and I participated in some of those meetings, and the decisions that had to be made were, you're going to be the next federal judge, you're going to be the next governor, you're going to be the next senator, you're going to be the ne next House of Representatives candidate. The men got up after those decisions, and lo and behold, it happened. The Mafia had a power that was unacknowledged and unchallenged, until the temptation to make even more money proved impossible to resist, and finally forced the US government to act. In the United States and Italy in the 1950s, the Mafia controlled many aspects of life. Yet the governments in both countries barely acknowledged the existence of organized crime. Law enforcement had a different enemy. The Cold War was at its height. The main target of the FBI were American communists, not Italian-American gangsters. Communist bloc has woven a vast network of espionage throughout the free world. The communist line is uniform and deadly. Destroy America. After World War II, in the FBI's New York office, there were 400 agents chasing communists. There were just five dealing with organized crime. The story was similar at the Department of Justice, where William Hundley worked. When I took over the organized crime section uh, in the uh, Justice Department in '87, there were basically, you know, maybe seven or eight lawyers there who were basically clipping uh, newspapers. Uh, they weren't doing anything either. The director of the FBI was J. Edgar Hoover. He had been its head for over 30 years. Hoover was one of the most powerful men in Washington, eventually serving under eight presidents. In law enforcement, what Hoover said went. And to Hoover, America's priority was the Red Menace. Hoover had almost no Italian-American agents who could infiltrate the mob. Indeed, he had few agents from any ethnic minority. At that time, Hoover did not have one black agent. He had no female agents. Excuse me. His chauffeur was black, so he made his chauffeur an agent, so he could say he had one black agent. In essence, he had all of these waspy guys, you know, with the snap hats <laughs> on and whatnot. Yeah. But from the late 1950s, a succession of events would change all that, finally forcing the authorities and the nation to acknowledge the existence of the Mafia. Once again, it all started in Sicily, and it was a story in which Mafia godfather Joe Bonanno played a central role. In late 1957, Bonanno took a trip back to his native Sicily. He had been born here in the tiny coastal town of Castellamare del Golfo, 
before emigrating to the US as a youngster. But Bonanno's trip was no sentimental journey. The Mafia Don was on business. Joe Bonanno had maintained close links with his family and criminal associates in the old country. He was approached by some old acquaintances for advice on a pressing problem. My dad told me that one of the leaders of the Palermo Mafia came to him and said that there's a few people that they would like to talk to him about certain problems that they're having here in, in, in Sicily. A meeting took place in this building, the Grand Hotel de Palme in Palermo, one of the top hotels in the Sicilian capital. Even to this day, details of who attended and what was discussed remain shrouded in mystery. Bonanno may not have been the only American present. Charles Lucky Luciano was now living in Italy, having been deported from the US after the war. Today, the Italian authorities believe that he was also present at the Hotel de Palme. From the 10th to the 16th of October 1957 in Palermo, in the Hotel de Palme, there was a summit of about 30 mafia bosses. American Cosa Nostra and Sicilian Mafia bosses. The major American families were represented. Joe Bonanno, Lucky Luciano, who had been in Italy since 1947, and then there were the local Mafia heads. Era presente Lucky Luciano, che era già in, uh, in, uh, in Italia dal 47, e poi erano presenti i capi mafia locali, i capi mafia siciliani. Over dinner, the Sicilians explained why they wanted the meeting. This was a business convention, and high on the agenda was the subject of drugs, which offered vast profit, but at a price. The purpose of the meeting was to pick my father's brains uh, as to how they were going to resolve a problem they were beginning to have among each other over the narcotics trade in Turkey. The Sicilians faced a dilemma. Various families within the Mafia were, having, were at odds as to whether they should or they shouldn't get themselves involved with this, and the, the younger element uh, saw nothing wrong in making a profit. In fact, the American Mafia was having the same debate about drugs. It seems that Joe Bonanno wasn't just offering friendly advice. He was there to close a deal that would reorganize the global trade in heroin. According to the FBI, it was this meeting which established the Bonanno family as the main players in the transatlantic heroin trade. The Sicilians would manufacture and smuggle the drug into the US. The Americans would distribute it and take a cut. This was the first time the mafias on both sides of the Atlantic had come together on such a scale. An early example of globalization, but run by organized crime. The Sicilian connection no si parla in epoca più tardi. The foundations were laid for collaboration between Sicilian Mafia, which wasn't yet called Cosa Nostra, and the American Cosa Nostra, which had, as its main objective, heroin trafficking. Bill Bonanno says the organization of the Mafia itself was also on the agenda, and that his father advised the Sicilians to copy Luciano's recipe for resolving disputes. It was at that meeting that he suggested that one of the ways that they might resolve their problem and have a little better handle on the situation is to do what the Americans had done, and that was to form a commission. The Sicilians did set up a commission, but it would only meet a few times and never gain the authority of the American original. In America, the subject of drugs continued to dominate Mafia discussions. The new organization that Luciano created uh, solved just about every problem you could think of, except one, narcotics. In the beginning, 
Luciano assumed that the organization could keep organized crime out of narcotics altogether. It simply was, wasn't worth the trouble. The difficulty was the money. And for the Mafia, money was always irresistible. The Americans arranged a summit to ratify the deal with their Sicilian cousins, a meeting that would provide one of the most infamous moments of their history. The deal between the Sicilian and American Mafia in late 1957 was a turning